So to review um, a few concepts that we're gonna need for the next rungs on the ladder we add, um, the first topic that we need to review is brightness. So remember there's a difference between apparent brightness, this is what we measure in the sky, and the luminosity of an object. That's the total amount of light that that object emits. And this distinction is really important because it's by combining these together with the inverse square law that we actually calculate distance for, for objects using various methods. So which one of these would depend on the distance from the Earth? All right, I see most votes for A. That's exactly right. It's kind of in the name, right? Apparent brightness is the brightness of an object as it appears to us. So that's going to depend on our distance from that object. All right, so this is the inverse square law that we use. So our apparent brightness is proportional to the luminosity divided by the distance squared. Um, we've used this equation reformulated in a different way to use the apparent and absolute magnitude. Remember those were little m and the big M. So this equation can be used in, in different ways and that just depends on how you're measuring that brightness and luminosity, whether you're measuring it in an intensity scale, which is more physically relevant or in that magnitude scale, which is easier to eyeball. So that's um, the different ways that we measure apparent brightness and luminosity. The apparent brightness you can eyeball, that's the magnitude scale, right? But you can also measure it with a detector. Um, actually, your phone is a pretty good light detector. And luminosity, if we know the luminosity of some object, like say, because we know its period, if it's a variable star, then we can calculate that distance. All right, so measure one, you have to know the other one somehow, and then you can calculate distance. Okay, so we're going to apply this in a new way than we did with variable stars, but that same principle is going to apply here to the new rung, which is the Tully Fisher relation. So the Tully Fisher relation, uh, we'll use this symbol for it, a rotating galaxy, because that's exactly what we're doing is looking at the rotation of a galaxy. So let me ask you a poll question. Um, if you know the radius of a star's orbit, let's say within our Milky Way and its velocity, then what can we determine with that information? Okay, I see most votes for C. Um, it, what we can get is the mass inside that particular star's orbit. So remember, this was how we found the mass of the disk of the Milky Way, and then we used um, the Doppler shift of some farther out gas to measure the mass of the entire Milky Way. That's how we figured out what fraction was dark matter last week. Okay. So um, when we think about how we could use this to measure the mass of other galaxies, um, the same principle basically applies. So uh, what would we expect a more massive galaxy to do? Rotate faster or rotate slower? Okay, I'm now seeing the most votes for A, that a more massive galaxy would rotate faster than a less massive galaxy. Here's how I explain it using the equation. Um, if I have more mass, then I can have higher speed because the radial position of that star, that's not changing. And G is a, a universal constant, that's definitely not changing. So more mass means more speed. All right, so this is the central principle that the tolle fisher relation uses, is that spiral galaxies with more mass rotate faster. And we can actually use this um, to calculate the distance. So there's another point that we need to understand first, which is um, what would we expect a more massive galaxy to do as far as how luminous it is? Would it produce more light or less light than a less massive galaxy? Okay, all 11 of you are saying more light. So right, if there's more mass in a galaxy, you expect probably most of that mass is coming from stars. Well, not most, but the some of the mass at least is coming from stars. If we assume that all spiral galaxies have a similar fraction of dark matter, which I actually don't know if that's a true statement or not, then we would say if there's more mass, there's more stars, so there's more light. All right, so that's our expectation. And it turns out that despite dark matter, that actually does hold true. Um, so this is, you know, doesn't make use of this equation at all, but this goes back to the um, idea of mass to light ratio, right? that the mass to light ratio is fairly similar for all spiral galaxies. Um, it's small and the mass to light ratio is large for elliptical galaxies. 
Okay. So spiral galaxies that have more mass are more luminous. So we're going to use the idea of more mass rotates faster and more mass, more light and put those together. And so the idea is that if you have a higher rotation rate, if we can measure the rotation speed of a galaxy, then we can figure out its mass and also its luminosity. Um, so measuring the rotation rate, this goes back to uh, the idea of the Doppler effect, right? If we have some spiral galaxy, uh, then we can look at the you know, stars in different edges of the galaxy or gas in different edges of the galaxy. So stars that are receding from us would be red shifted. Their spectra would be red shifted. Whereas the stars approaching us would be blue shifted. We've seen this idea before, right? And so by figuring out the, the speed of the um, red shift and the blue shift, we can figure out the rotation speed of the whole galaxy. All right. So this is gonna add another rung for us on the cosmic distance ladder. And this method is more useful than variable stars at long distances, simply because the spiral galaxies we use for this method are at farther distances, right? So we're probing farther into space just because that sample that we're probing is farther in space. Um, okay, I think I didn't say it, but so all of these methods, the well, the Tully Fisher, the variable star method, and this spectral parallax method. What's particular about all these is we use a independent measurement to get the luminosity, right? So for the Tully Fisher relation, that independent measurement is the rotation speed, which gives us the mass, which gives us the luminosity. For the variable stars, it was the period of variation that gave us the luminosity. And for the spectral parallax method, in case you're curious, it's the spectral class of the star that gives us the luminosity. If you took 122, you should remember spectral class, but if you didn't, don't worry about it. Okay, so all these methods, we we still need to measure the apparent brightness before we can calculate the distance using the inverse square law. Okay, there's one more rung that can go even farther than our Tully Fisher relation. And it's probably more useful in one sense because the Tully Fisher relation can only give you the distance to spiral galaxies. So that's not too helpful if you want to measure the distance to say an elliptical or an irregular galaxy. So we'll use this uh, red symbol here for our type 1a supernovae because it's a stellar explosion. So this is an example of what we would call a standard candle. Um, a standard candle is any object that has basically a fixed value for its luminosity. So spiral galaxies tend to have a relatively constant luminosity. Um, but there is variation. We already know that Andromeda and the Milky Way have different masses and different sizes. So they have different luminosities. So a spiral is a relatively good standard candle, but not that great. Um, a planetary nebula, which is like the shell of a star that's undergone a kind of low grade stellar explosion. Um, that has a fairly constant luminosity because those small stars tend to have a similar mass. Uh, but even that is not that good because stars do vary in mass. But the type 1 supernova, that tends to have a very good um, standard luminosity. And what a type 1 supernova is, um, is when there's a white dwarf star, this is the core of a dead star, and it steals some mass from a companion star, if it's in a binary system, then all of the uh, material that gets transferred burns on the surface of the white dwarf quickly because the white dwarf is such a hot remnant and that causes an explosion. So that's a type 1a supernova. This is like life after death for a white dwarf star. So it's like a zombie event, I guess. And this is the uh, method that has the smallest spread in luminosity. So a type 1a supernova is a, a good standard candle. All right, but there's one method that is uniquely situated to give us very accurate measures of distance and that's Hubble's law. So this is kind of the final rung on our distance ladder. 